Now it gives me great pleasure to introduce our last speaker before lunch, Professor David Phillips, and his talk is entitled Chemistry in Micro Time. So give it to you. Well, it's a great pleasure and privilege to be here to talk about George's work. <clears throat> um, I came to the Royal Institution in uh, 1979, I actually started in 1980, uh, and so I was a colleague, if you like, uh, of, of George's for all of the time he was in the RI, but then of course uh, there was life after the RI as well in that he moved to Imperial College when he left here, he moved his research group, and I left here to go to Imperial College also in 1989. Uh, and so for the last years of his life, we were colleagues at Imperial College too. And uh, <clears throat> we, I, we got to know each other very well. And I have to say, he was enormously kind to me during, during my career. And that was typical of him, I think. So um, I want to, uh, now they've got to work out to move this thing on. What is it? How does this work? Oh, on the back. The right one. Am I doing the right one? No, I don't know. Go back. Yes. <laughs> right. That's the one I was <coughs> We're on my slides now, it's all right. So I just wanted to remind people that uh, uh, in his uh, middle to later years, how avuncular he was. He was a, uh, a charming man. Uh, and I'm going to, I used for this title, his own title, as a volume produced, called Chemistry and Microbes. I don't know if I was. <coughs> So I want to talk about some of the, the uh, some of the work he did moving on the time scale to, to shorter and shorter times, uh, starting in Sheffield and then ending up in Imperial College. And this was the title he used. And this is from his Nobel uh, address. Uh, he dates the progress down to 1861, uh, when Fox Palmer took, took uh, uh, an image of a rapidly rotating page of a newspaper uh, using a series of Leiden jars to discharge a lamp uh, and was able to get the time resolution so that you could read the paper, which was quite remarkable. But in, you've seen this slide before, the, <clears throat> if you take one second as the arbitrary unit of time, then in George's time we went down to 15 orders of memory. And if you went the other way, getting longer, as he used to point out, you would end up at, uh, before the time of the first humans on, on the planet. So it's a, a, a huge range of time. So above a second, you can call it macro time, and below a second, you can call it uh, micro time. Well, <clears throat> his adventures in micro time really uh, started when he became a, a research student in, of, uh, of Norwich in, in Cambridge. And this is him having just been discharged, I think, from the, from the Navy, where he served during the war. And I want to show you the processes that occur uh, on the kind of time scales that encompass from milliseconds through to femtoseconds. Um, if you, the ground state of most molecules is a singlet state in that there are two electrons in, a, in an orbital which are paired. One spins one way, one spins the other, so there's no net spin. Uh, of the electrons. That's a singlet state. And when you absorb light, 
you'd reach any of a manifold of excited singlet states, electronically excited, uh, and these, <clears throat> again, still have their electrons paired. They're not, the electrons are not in the same orbit, but they are still thin paired. So they're still singlet states, and they're very short-lived. For a molecule to drop from the singlet state back down to the ground state is very easy. There's no spin inversion process involved, so it happens in a very facile way. But while the molecule's in its excited singlet state, you can get a spin inversion process, which leads to what's called a triplet state, which is paramagnetic. And now for the uh, triplet state to drop back down to the ground, the ground state, the state it wants to be in, uh, there has to be another spin inversion process, and that's an unlikely process. So these states tend to be long lived. So a typical lifetime of a singlet state would be of the order of nanoseconds, uh, which is shown here, uh, or sometimes longer. Well, that's an, this is a fluorescent process, nanoseconds, 10 to the minus 9, 10 to the minus 7. Uh, a triplet state might last for seconds, in fact, might last for uh, quite a long time. But a typical lifetime in, in fluid media would be uh, milliseconds through to anything as long as a hundred seconds in a condensed media. <clears throat> so you can get the sort of time scales of basic photochemical processes that you might want to study, that the interesting ones really are of a millisecond to microsecond for the triplet state. Uh, Picosecond, nanosecond through to picosecond and beyond uh, for excited singlet states. Now, there are other processes occurring as well, and we'll come across those uh, in due course. So, flash photolysis, for which uh, was awarded the Nobel Prize in 67, really encompasses transient absorption techniques, the so called hope and probe experiment. You excite a molecule with a, a, maker, a flash of, of light. And then you interrogate what's happened with the second flash of light, the probe, and this is delayed in time. So what you get is a complete spectrum of the um, electronic spectrum, usually absorption uh, of the intermediate species that you produce with the first flash. And if you then delay the time that you observe the the, uh, uh, the spectrum. You get the kinetic of what's happening also. So the alternative for that is to use a continuous single wavelength monitoring, uh, which gives you high quality kinetic data, but does not help you identify what you're looking at. And then finally, you can use fluorescence, which is an emission process and therefore is, is a very sensitive, you can monitor it very sensitively and get kinetic uh, data from, from that. Well, one of the first type of experiment he did in Sheffield, well, actually Cambridge, then Sheffield, was to just show that there, there's the reaction vessel, the vessel with a major flash tube which lights the molecules and causes the chemistry to happen or the intermediates to be formed. And there's the spectrum flash which interrogates what's happened, and there's the spectrograph which records the result. And that's a typical early pump and probe experiment. This is probably one of the first papers he produced in Cambridge, a uh, structure of nethylene, CH2, which is a, a well known intermediate in organic reactions where you can increase the chain length of a, 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 a compounds uh, by adding a, a CH2 to a a hydrocarbon, for example, and extending the chain. He was not terribly proud of this paper for some reason. It says in his own writing that he was not very satisfied with it. But nevertheless, it, it shows, uh, it, I think this is the first paper he produced with, with Norris. Uh, I want to dwell on this one just a little bit because uh, it's, it's an example of kind of serendipity, if you like, in, in science, which occurs all the time. Uh, here is one of the first 
three radicals he looked at, you know, chloride oxide, uh, CMO, uh, and it was easy to produce. He did very nice kinetic and spectroscopic measurements on this, this molecule, uh, <clears throat> but it, only because it was there. He had no uh, interest in, in any particular reactions of it. Much, much later, it became one of the most important uh, molecules in the atmosphere. And so, uh, and you may remember this from, this is the Halley Bay results in Antarctica, monitoring how much ozone there was in the stratosphere. Simple Dobson spectrophotometer, which monitored total ozone on in the stratosphere. In August, you see there's plenty there. This is in the winter, of course, in the, in the Antarctic. By spring, when the sun has come up, the ozone has totally disappeared. And this is the, the, uh, the ozone hole, so-called, which it first discovered actually uh, in 1985. Uh, but th these are the, the results in 87, which showed that it got much worse. There, there really was a total disappearance of ozone. Uh, at that time. So, uh, this had been discovered, but the mechanism by which this ozone loss happened was really uh, determined by this man. Uh, I, I show this in it because I was at that meeting, Sherwood Rowan, uh, Sherry Rowan. Uh, George should have been there. He was invited to attend because of the chlorine monoxide that he had discovered and recorded in, in uh, 1940, whenever it was. Uh, but he had double booked. Uh, he couldn't travel, he went somewhere else, so he sent me in his place. I, I was at the RI then. And so I took that photograph, which uh, uh, is Interesting. You were allowed to take photographs. It's the only scientific meeting I've ever been to, I think, where nobody left before the end, uh, because we all got to meet the Pope on the Saturday morning. Uh, and you were allowed to take photographs, but you could not use flash. And incidentally, the only photographs I took, I took a lot, the only ones which turned out were the ones which had the Pope in them. It wasn't, wasn't a dividing sort of intervention, I think. The fact that he's wearing white, he was enough reflected light for us to turn out. But Sherry Rowland it was who discovered that, or, or proposed correctly, that what was happening was that uh, chlorofluorocarbons, which we used as a refrigerant, were diffusing from the lower atmosphere into the stratosphere. And in the winter it didn't matter because there wasn't any sunlight. As soon as the sun came up in the spring, uh, these were dissociated by the sunlight to produce chlorine atoms. Chlorine mopped up ozone to form this chlorine monoxide daughter study. And then the chlorine monoxide reacted with the precursor of the ozone, the oxygen atom, to regenerate the chlorine and produce uh, oxygen. So the net result was the destruction of ozone and the formation, reformation of, of, of oxygen. And this is a classic chain reaction, uh, and it, it just continues until there's no more feedstock left, the ozone is all gone. So George did not know that this, this small species, CLO, was going to be of importance. It turned out to be of su really supreme importance in determining how much ozone we had in our atmosphere. Uh, and as a result of Sherry Rowland's intervention, the Montreal Protocol was signed, which forbade the use of these chlorofluorocarbons. Uh, and uh, so we are on the way to recovery uh, of the ozone layer. It will take another 50 years before, in fact, to the pre use uh, level. And actually, that has now it, it has slowed. There are factories in northeast China which are illegally producing these, these chlorofluorocarbons. Which you can now buy in London. They're imported through Romania. You may have seen the press last week. Sorry about this. Uh, so that we shouldn't be complacent 
uh, that bad things can still happen. Oh, well, that just is a correlation. I want to just make an aside here. George really earned his reputation and his Nobel Prize for the study of fast reactions. But there's another way of looking at intermediates. If you, uh, if you can't study on the right time scale, you can slow everything down and so then see them with more conventional uh, pieces of apparatus. And so this technique, tra trapping intermediate species in a glass cage or in matrix isolation as it's called, uh, he developed and he used, you see in, oops, 1954 is the date of that. Uh, he then abandoned it because other people were doing it. Uh, but it's, it should be noted that he was well aware of the fact that there are two different ways of trying to get at the same uh, identification of inter intermediates. One is to slow things down, the other is to look on a faster and faster time scale. Right. Um, he spent a lot of time, this is in Sheffield, uh, developing a spark source which would be, uh, give you a very, very short pulse. Uh, and uh, these became very useful in it, a technique which I'll describe shortly. So nanosecond light sources in Sheffield, he was able to make light sources uh, with a duration of about 8 to 50 nanoseconds, which is really quite remarkable. Typically, to get a large out output, you would be constrained to microseconds. The microsecond flash is what he really developed in, in, in Sheffield. But with, he was able to show you could go a bit shorter than that. Uh, not much, but with difficulty, you could. Uh, so what did, we, what did he do with the kind of flash repulsive apparatus in Sheffield? that was, was novel. Well, he had a variety of co-workers. Frank Wilkinson uh, was very in, in, interested in uh, aromatic molecules. And so he recorded the flash photolysis of uh, had quite dilute uh, solutions of anthracene hydrocarbons uh, in hexane, a whole variety of them, and was able eventually to see the singlet state and the triplet state uh, and, and then even a higher English state. Uh, so Frank was uh, one of uh, George's very productive uh, uh, students. Uh, he was able to look at energy transfer from those spe the excited species to other molecules, again hydrocarbons, and work out uh, the, the uh, critical distance involved in the energy transfer from one to the other. But what revolutionized the time scales accessible to the experiment uh, the experimentalist was oops, the advent of lasers. Uh, the, the invention by Theodore Miner in, in 1960 uh, of first of all the Ruby laser, the solid state laser, and then came along the near laser. Gas lasers, uh, helium neon, not particularly useful, argon iron. Uh, became a, a, a very potent weapon, uh, and then excitement lasers, ultraviolet lasers. These could be used to drive dye lasers, so you could tunability, you could choose whichever wavelength you wanted uh, to excite your system, and then you could then generate very short pulses from these lasers by a technique of mode locking, uh, which we'll talk a little about, uh, about in a minute. And so, uh, this is from the Nobel uh, Symposium, uh, where he reviewed progress to date, including the first use of lasers in, in uh, uh, genetic studies. Um, this, George, as you may have heard, uh, much loved horrible molecule, which uh, he studied at length both in solution and in situ in, in green plants. And the, uh, the time scale, this is some of the kinetics that he uh, looked at. He 
sorry about the non SI units, but this is your own slide. Uh, and it's also given in rate <coughs> constants rather than lifetime. So you have to invert these numbers in order to get an idea of what the rate constant, what the lifetime would be. See, this is and 10 to the 8, so we're talking about the nanosecond time scale here. And these are some of the processes which occur in, in chlorophyll A uh, through fluorescence and also the triplet state. Uh, this was the first laser apparatus which uh, was developed in the Royal Institution with Michael Trock, who we, we met in the floor. Uh, <clears throat> and this, I just want to show a succession of these just to show that the basic principle of all of these experiments is the same the pump and probe current. So here we have <clears throat> uh, a ruby laser. Uh, and reflected into the reaction vessel where it causes the reaction to occur. And then there's an interrogatory flash, which is from the same laser, which is just delayed by a delay unit, which is an optical delay. Light travels at certain centimeters per nanosecond or so. You can get the delay you want just by delaying the interrogatory cost by the optical time. And that was what was done here in, in uh, my clock's apparatus. Uh, and the same, the same principle pump, probe, and there's the. At the. Shortly after uh, uh, my clock's. Uh, Experiments that were done in the, in the Royal Institution. There was a succession of uh, really talented uh, students, Godfrey Bagard being one of them. Uh, that's what he looks like now, he was more youthful then. Uh, and <clears throat> he was able to make fluorescence measurements <laughs> rather than pump and probe absorption measurements uh, on a variety of uh, different materials. These, this is a uh, aromatic hydrocarbons uh, and what he was showing here was that if you pumped at higher and higher energy uh, in the signal state the lifetime got shorter and shorter and you were actually turning on a non-radiated decay process uh, which completed the excited state population and that those measurements done also with Graham Fleming in a minute um, were very, very useful in, in developing the theories of non radiated decay. Uh, people like Carl Fried in the United States uh, and uh, Will Robinson uh, used these sort of uh, data to uh, understand what was important in determining, determining the rate of non radiated decay. You could measure picosecond lifetimes by uh, a rather ingenious device. And I, I, this is uh, Ewan Reed, who you saw in one of the earlier, earlier slides, the one with the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh. Uh, there was a fellow wearing specs in the, in the, just behind. That was Ewan Reed who developed this. Um, here you have a laser, you're exciting the sample, there's an optical delay. And this is a way of opening a shutter in order to vary the time between excitation and observation. And it, it's ingenious because it involves this substance carbon disulfide uh, and two polarizers. There's a polarizer there and a polarizer there. So the plane of polarization of the light, if you cross the polarizers, no light can transmit through, through those uh, polarizers. That's that's, you kept the, uh, the shutter shut, if you like, by having these things uh, cost. So the laser, the delayed laser cost, this pathway here, had an effect on the carbon disulfide of rotating the plane of polarization to 90 degrees. So that the cross, there's no light there, if the pulse goes through, it opens the shutter by rotating to 90 degrees for as long as it takes for the carbon disulfide to recover. 
That turns out to be very short. It turns out to be uh, So you have a little, very ingenious optical way opening a shutter for people to do it. But they, that was the mechanism by which they did it. And they were able to uh, look at fluorescence. You could polarize the fluorescence and, and look at rotational motion of molecules uh, on, a, on a, in this case, a nanosecond time scale, but you could go some. So I found <coughs> correlated single four going carotene. I've shown a book which. Uh, as O'Connor and I were when we were first here in the Royal Institution, in the Royal Institution. And we had started developing this in Southampton, where, where I was before I moved to, to the RI. And George, with through uh, Godfrey Badard and, and uh, Graham Fleming, had also uh, started to develop some correlated encounter. At the time, we were using flash light. Based on the design that George had developed in Sheffield. And in order to get a very short pulse of light, you really had a, a rather small physical device, a small lamp. And if you imagine that when you looked at a spark plug in a, in, a, in a car, that was about the amount of light we got out of the short pulse. Very weak. And on a free running lamp, which is what most people used at the time, the intensity of the pulse varied pulse to pulse, and also the time between pulses was very variable. It was a very far from ideal source of light to do time So, what transformed that situation was the development of. Um, Modlock lasers, and I think I, I have a, uh, the development of a picosecond uh, flash microscopy, uh, if you like. Th this is the device that they built here in the Royal Institution. They applied it to photosynthesis. There's David Crow, who <coughs> came with George to uh, Imperial College. And there's James Durant, who did the same, uh, and both of them are now professors in chemistry at Imperial College, very, very successful academics. Uh, and George uh, had collaborated with the late Jim Barber for a very long time while they were at the Royal Institution, working on, on uh, system one two and two. Synthesis, uh, and that turned out to be a huge and productive um, collaboration in, in, in Imperial. Uh, just to show you that uh, this fluorescence decay uh, in Florida, this is quite early on, this is in 1977, uh, and you're looking at fluorescence decay curves there. Uh, I show this because I um, just anticipate some of the things there you're going to say about, uh, about artificial photosynthesis in due course. These were, this was a model system for photosynthesis, uh, which was uh, studied by Sylvia de Peter Costa, uh, uh, Brian Auger, who people may remember, George. Uh, but I include, I also Point out that name, John Foynes. Does that ring a bell with anybody? Remember the Chicago Democrat Convention in 1968, where there were a number of people arrested. It was a, it was a very brutal put down by the police of, of a demonstration. Uh, one of the participants in that demonstration who was arrested and charged was this gentleman, John Foynes, who had been researched to. George in, in uh, the RI. So uh, his fame uh, is not due to his academic powers, but uh, his running with the Chicago police. 
This is just a detail of the femtosecond flash system uh, developing in Bureau College. And the details are not important except to note, as ever, uh, that it involved combination of lasers, but it, it is still a pump and probe experiment, but now on a femtosecond one. Run out of time, but these are just transient absorption kinetics uh, of uh, what of the systems they were, the photosystems they were looking at. So <clears throat> I've got a few minutes left. I thought we might just look at some of the developments which came after George. George saw the development from 10 to the minus 3 of a second to 10 to the minus 15. Uh, what has happened since then is worthy of note. And I like to think almost all of this <coughs> owes a lot to George's development of natural policy. Well, fluorescence microscopy has become widely available. Time is all for us. I spend a little bit of time on that. Time is all vibration. Monitoring either fluorescence or transient absorption does not give you any any structural information about these medias. You have to use other techniques in order to get empirical structure. And one of them that somebody in a laboratory not doing time result work would use would be the infrared spectrum. Product to tell you what you've got. NMR, of course, is widely used, but you can't do time resolved NMR, so I'm not going to talk about that one. But the others that you use is crystallography, X ray diffraction, and electron diffraction. They allow you to look at the structure of the stable molecule. But if you could apply that in a time resolved manner, you could get information about the structure of the intermediate species. Some of which might be three to second duration and, and shorter. And then coherent studies is a very special technique going to the properties of laser excitation. And then finally, let's just move three orders of magnitude shorter than what George achieved in his life. Uh, I think I'll skip that. This is when we were in, uh, all together in Imperial College, we founded uh, a center for photomolecular science, really around George. It was, it was uh, not exactly to give him something to do, he had plenty to do, uh, but was, it, it was to honor him. So he was, the, he was the only chairman of that, of that uh, center that we had. Uh, and Several, there were people from physics, uh, there were people from biology, people from chemistry, uh, and biochemistry. And one of the participants in that was uh, Paul French in physics, and he developed this uh, fluorescence lifetime imaging system, which is shown there. It's a, effectively a laser excitation down a microscope. Uh, in this case, we can put polarizers in so that you can you can measure the motion of molecules in in biologic living biological systems. That's an important point. Uh, and so this is uh, an isotropy imaging of a, of a, a probe in, in living cells, um, and it. it Images the variation in the local viscosity of the cells, and that turns out to be of importance because um, certain physiological changes in the cell, which cause changes in the viscosity, are good markers for the onset of disease at various times. So this was done in collaboration with uh, Dan Davies in, again in biology, moved to the University of Manchester a few years ago, and I have just heard he's coming back. Uh, to Imperial as leader of science and so on. Time resolved vibrational spectroscopy is 
the sort of experiment you do with a normal infrared spectrometer or a Raman spectrometer uh, and get structural information. And just to show you, this, these experiments were all done uh, in, in the Rutherford Appleton labs, the laser science facility. And I hesitate to show it because George himself was not in favor of major national facilities of this sort, but particularly the laser work. Uh, he felt laser work should be done in individual laboratories in, in uh, the university department. Uh, I tended to disagree because I felt there were many places which could usefully use the output of lasers to get results which were meaningful to them, but they didn't necessarily have the expertise to actually do the experiment. So I, I, I believe that the central facility was a useful one. And, and so it is proved, I think. Um, this is uh, a Parmesan Raman experiment, and the only point of note is that. You have a pump source, you have a delay line, it's a pump and probe experiment, but this is done on picosecond time scales. But what you're monitoring here is not absorption or emission, it's the infrared spectrum or the Raman spectrum uh, of I'll show you just one slide of the work that we did. Um, where you, you can see you can get. Uh, a molecule, molecule which exhibits intramolecular charge transfer, and you can get a peak here, uh, which turns out to be the charge transfer state. And the position of where that peak is, is a short lived transient, tells you about what the structure of that molecule is. It improves the molecule. And you can measure hybrid bonding and all sorts of other things. You have kinetic information as well as structural information. Diffraction is now widely used. Uh, it's um, femtosecond X ray diffraction. It's just a recent paper, yeah, that's 2004. Uh, electron diffraction, this is much more recent, 2021. This paper comes up. This is ultra short pulsed X ray and electron sources, and this is now applied to uh, molecular assemblies. These are the crystals that have been looked at. This is the, the basis of the experiment is simply to excite uh, an intermediate and then use a probe it with a delayed uh, electron pulse, which gives you a diffraction pattern. Very detailed. Okay. Coherence, this is pretty much one of the last things I want to say. Uh, really developed by Marcus Gray, who himself was awarded the Nobel Prize, uh, not just here in George, obviously, uh, but then taken on by Graham Fleming, uh, who was George's student, so if you like, is, uh, Scientific fund. And Craig Scholes did a, did a <coughs> postdoc with Graham Fleming, uh, and so is George Bruce Bradley Grant somewhere. <coughs> what do we mean by coherence? Well, <coughs> the observation is the way, which I think is a really beautiful experiment, where you have this molecule of sodium iodide, there's the potential well. And you excite coherently, coherent laser coherent in time and space. And so you move a wave packet, if you like, up to the excited state, and then it just oscillates within the potential energy uh, bounds of the piece. So that when it's in this position, it can emit, you get a pulse of light. And when it's on the other turning point there, you get another emitted photon, and it's moving very rapidly in between, so you don't really get what emission you do. do. So the two things you see are at the two turning And that coherence actually survives for the whole duration of this time. You get this wonderful quantum beats. Uh, you get the Peterson today, 
uh, which is uh, really quite remarkable. Now it was believed that he could excite anything coherently, but the coherence would not persist more than a very, very short time in the future. You wouldn't be able to observe it. And what Graham in Berkeley and Greg Scholes now in Princeton uh, did was to show that nothing's wrong. And even in large polyatomic molecules, in the protosystems, in fact, in, in, in photosynthesis, you do have a persistence of the coherence within these molecules over a period of things that can just work. So that uh, people would have to think again about what losing coherence means in a those are the decay dynamics of molecules. Uh, finally, uh, at a second study, moving three orders of magnitude shorter than was achieved uh, in the RI and in the Republic. You can make clusters of light from a laser, which are not exactly 10 to the minus 15 of a second. You always exaggerate. A picture study laser is. But the uh, at a second laser this day they are useful. And whereas it was said that chemistry would finish on the piece of the time, I don't tend to the minus 13, 12, 13, because that is the time taken. For the nuclear assembly of, of, of molecules to rearrange or to associate or whatever. <coughs> what drives that process is the electronic uh, position of the, position of the electron. The excitation process itself takes about 10 to minus 15 minutes. And if that consequent on that, there are further changes. Uh, <coughs> charge transfer, electron transfer in the excited state, they are the process that the movement of the electrons have is what moves on a much further time the <coughs> positions of the nuclear. So it's not true to say that chemistry finishes kind of the last 13 of second. It finishes really uh, on the 10 at a second scale. So there are many studies call that physics if you like, or you can call it chemistry or both. Uh, and in, in what you see here is you, you can actually look at the excitation process and it might induce photofragmentation, electron transfer, all occurring on this time scale, and you can observe it using aspective forces. Uh, in atomic physics, uh, you get uh, ionization tethering, that sort of process. Solid state physics, you can look at exciton dynamics, the movement of excitation within a solid, and all sorts of other things as well. So that chemistry doesn't finish uh, uh, on a nuclear time scale, it finishes uh, on an electronic time scale and is now being studied. I don't think we can go much further than that. In any case, we can't because of it's not that. So that's where we are. So I'd like to finish just by saying that George has left an incredible legacy uh, in terms of studying ultra fast protons. Uh, he saw in his lifetime 12 orders of magnitude change uh, in terms of the reaction of the reaction book. And <coughs> John or Andrew already showed the occasion that this was. Uh, I think uh, in terms of his, his work on micro time, he moved this 12 orders of magnitude. I think his legacy is such that we will remember, I don't know for how many orders of magnitude in macro time, uh, what he actually achieved. I love, this is my favorite slide of George. This is at the end of his valedictory discourse, probably on the occasion of his birthday, also. 
the presence of uh, uh, doing one of the things that we also love to do is imbibing the entire classic campaign. So I think metaphorically, we might raise a glass ourselves uh, to George and his time.